Abba's heart, finding our way back to the Father's delight. All right, y'all, we're in chapter 15, Overcoming the Counterfeit Father. Overcoming the Counterfeit Father. We're going to talk a little bit about the devil today. Um, before we begin, let's pray to our true Father. Let's take a deep cleansing breath. Oh, Heavenly, Heavenly Father, Heavenly Father, you are a good, good Father. You are so good. You are so good to us. You love us. You accept us. You draw us back to you. You sent your son to save us. I just thank you this morning for the gift of Jesus. I thank you for the gift of the Holy Spirit. I thank you for learning who you are as Father so that we can expose the lies of the enemy. I thank you for um, for people like Matt Lozano and Neil Lozano who have spent their entire um, careers helping to teach us who you truly are and helping to expose the lies of the enemy. I just ask that you send your spirit upon us today as we press into this to illuminate those areas that we have come into agreement with darkness, to illuminate those areas of our lives that are still dark. Give us the courage to surrender those to you. Help us to trust you. Help us to trust you. Help us to break free of our old self so that we can rise again with Christ to come to you as our Father. We need your help. We're powerless without you, but with you we are everything. We can do all things through Christ who strengthens us. And so we just give you ourselves today. We give you ourselves. We surrender to you. We trust you. We trust you. Jesus, I trust in you. Jesus, I trust in you. And it is in your name that we offer this prayer this morning. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Okay, overcoming the counterfeit father. Overcoming the counterfeit father. So, you know, we're talking today in this chapter about Satan's tactics. Um, I touched on this a little bit as we've gone through, but just um, some characteristics about who Satan is and understanding um, basically that his entire goal is to detract you, de to, to distract you, and to steal you from the Father. For, for no, for not, to, he'd love to steal you, but he wants you to come willingly to him, to turn your back on the Heavenly Father, to come willingly to him. And, um, you know, he's a counterfeit father. He's posed here as a counterfeit father, and that's what he is. He is not his own. He takes what God intends for good and distorts that. Right, and we have to understand his tactics, and we have to understand his characteristics. And and one of the things that um, the author drives home today is that we do not have to be scared of him. He who is in us is greater than he who is in the world. We don't have to be scared of him. We shouldn't be scared of him. Uh, we should not fear him. We shouldn't even focus on him. We just need to know who he is and what he's about so that we can expose his tactics. Okay, Satan don't take the day off, y'all. You get you gain a little bit of freedom. He's going to hunker down and try harder to get back at you to pull you back towards him. He is the father of lies. So what we've what we have here is just um, it's just information about how he works, who he is, and how he works. Um, he starts with um, a scenario um, of a baseball game. We're not going to get into that. Um, but he talks about, um, he does talk about the scripture story briefly of David and Goliath and how Goliath taunted the army of Israel and then how David just killed him with a stone. Um, we have an adversary who wants to pull us away from God, who wants to usurp is the word that he used, God's place, and who wants to be our counterfeit father. Um, we have broken free from the dominion of the enemy. You're in the process right now. Um, as we've gone through all this stuff and recognizing the, the places in our life that are dark, recognizing the places in our life that still need to be healed, recognize the places that perhaps we have unforgiveness still, or we have chosen to dive into more because we want greater degrees of freedom. So we are in the process of breaking free from the dominion of Satan, okay? We're in the process of breaking free. That doesn't mean he's going to quit trying, Okay, he still seeks 
to, we, we broke free first when we were baptized, okay? When we baptized, we came out from under that. But he, from, because we have this inclination towards sin called concupiscence, and we're in the flesh, everything around us in this world is um, fleshy, all right? There's, there's enticements everywhere. There's wounds, there's bondage, okay? He's been doing what he could do to get back to, to gain footing in your life since your baptism, since you were born, right? Um, the, the influence that he wants to gain is like a foothold. So think about like, think about like a castle with a fortress or, or think about, um, think about like maybe in the old times where, um, where they, where someone comes in and it's not even really old times, you know, but like in, in strategies of war, um, when you when you get a little bit into the enemy camp and you've sort of got them all rustled up, you get what's called a foothold. You stay there long enough and you can bring in reinforcements and you can establish ground. That becomes a stronghold. That's the same thing that Satan does in our life. Okay, that is the same thing that Satan does to us. Every place that we begin to come into agreement with his lies, um, those, those become footholds. The longer that those lies run over and over in our mind, the more things that happen in our life that sort of fall into this, um, something happens here and it sort of falls into this crevice of a lie that we've believed about ourselves. I'm not worthy. Um, you know, no one loves me. Okay, there can be many things in your life that happen that fall into this category, if you will. And so most of us have three or four or five or six categories, all right? And there's all this stuff happening out here in the world, and it falls into our specific categories. Well, the first time we begin to think a thought that is contrary to something God has planted in us, a thought contrary to um, to his identity, to our identity in him, that would be the foothold, okay? Every time something happens and we run that in our head again, I'm not worthy, I'm not worthy, or um, no one loves me. Someone rejects you again. It could be something as simple as somebody that you see at, you know, you're out at Walmart or something and someone doesn't recognize you because they're off in their own little world. It, it, if your mind is in a bad enough place, you're going to think, what would I do? They must not like me anymore because they didn't say hi to me. All right. I mean, or what's going on with them? They're trying to, you know, they didn't, they didn't answer my text message, so um, they must be snobbing me, or they didn't, um, they didn't comment on my Facebook post, so therefore this, okay, the longer that those thoughts play over and over again in our mind, it goes down into these three or four or five or six uh, original lies that we've come into agreement with, that, that foothold becomes a stronghold. Do you see what I'm saying? That foothold becomes a stronghold because we, because this happened maybe when we were young, the first time we ever thought that thought. But now all this stuff that happens in our life, many times it's just sort of filtered into these handful of lies that we've come into agreement with. So the foothold has become a stronghold in our life. That's the way the enemy works. That's the way the enemy works. He schemes. He schemes to bring us under his control and into deeper slavery to sin, okay? Because what's going to happen when we feel these things, when we feel this rejection, when we feel this anxiety, when we feel this void, we're going to seek anything other than God. We may seek the safety of our home to not have to go out and deal with people and deal with this and deal with that, all right? If God is not your Savior, if Jesus Christ is not your Savior, then you have an idol, if Jesus Christ is not your Savior, you have an idol. So therefore, even in your woundedness, you have come into agreement with sin. You have your own sin. By isolation, perhaps, or by something that you're partaking in, anything that you put, maybe even a friendship, anything that you put in front of, of God, Jesus, the Holy Spirit, the Father, anything that you put in front of that, be in your comforter, you know, be in your consolation, be in the way, Anything that you put in front of that becomes an idol, and that is, that's the number one commandment, you know. Um, that's a big one. So, I'm just saying where it talks about he schemes to bring us under his control and in deeper slavery to sin. 
when we are not fully 100% available, we're always going to be sinning this side of heaven is what I'm trying to say. Even in our woundedness, our woundedness, that, that was how he got in and that has caused us to sin. That has caused us to believe the lies of the enemy, okay? We all face unwelcome and anxious thoughts. Some accuse us, others tempt us. Many do not affirm the truth about who we are in Jesus, the Son. Some of these thoughts come within. Others are presented to our imagination from without. Okay. When things are presented to our imagination, imagine you've got like the, an angel here and a devil here. You've seen that depicted in cartoons. That's sort of the way it really is. Okay. You have a guardian angel who has been assigned to you from the moment of your conception um, to guard you. Okay. You also have... Um, demonic forces that have been assigned to whisper lies to you from the, mo from the moment of your conception, okay? So it sort of is like sometimes our thoughts come from within ourselves and sometimes it's sort of whispered in our ear by the demonic, okay? Oh, hey, remember that person? They didn't do this. Remember that person? They didn't do this. You have to understand the schemes of the enemy. You have to understand the schemes of the enemy. And if, if this stuff interests you, just knowing about who your enemy is, um, there's, a, there's an exorcist priest called Father Chad Ripperger, and he has some great... Um, videos on uh, guardian angels and and the demonic we've learned this stuff from live ex from exorcisms i mean i'm not trying to wig wig anybody out or anything but it's tr it's real and we have to know our enemy because we can't just bury our head and act like he doesn't exist it's one of the greatest schemes that the enemy ever um came up with was to, co to convince people he didn't exist that's just not true you don't have the holy spirit without having unholy spirits okay um the darkened mind and fiery darts. He talks about that on the bottom of page 184. Um, the thoughts that come from our fallen human nature is what Paul calls a darkened mind. St. Paul calls that a darkened mind. And that's combined with the thoughts of our enemy, those fiery darts that are that he shoots at us. So, you know, we struggle with our own self, but then don't think for a minute that he's not just planting stuff at you all the time, you know? So we have to understand his schemes. We have to understand our enemy. Doesn't mean we have to focus on him, okay? But it's just like any other war. You better know who you're fighting, right? You better know who you're fighting. We know who's, who's on our side. We know who whose army, I mean, Jesus, right? But we, we have to understand who it is that we're fighting here. So footholds can become strongholds, all right? And, and I'm sure that each one of us has an experience where we can see where that has happened in our lives. Um, the schemes of the devil. Distorted views of the devil are not hard to find. This is at the top of page 185. Either... Either we either and sometimes you'll come across people who exaggerate his importance. Please understand that that's not what I'm trying to do here. This is this is um, this is just education here because on the same token, we don't need to exaggerate his importance because he's not important. He just has a place, and we have to understand his schemes and his tactics. We have to know, yeah, and and you sort of have to know the hierarchy. Like he is not Jesus's equal. Okay, absolutely not. He is the equal to St. Michael the Archangel who kicked his butt out of heaven, right? And a third of them that went with him. But Jesus, he is not Jesus' equal. And I think sometimes people would think that it's, that he's pitted, you know, against Jesus. And no, absolutely not. All power and authority on heaven, on earth, and under the earth, Jesus Christ has. Okay, all power and authority. So his importance is either exaggerated as a real, um, or he's ignored as a real spiritual enemy. And we can't ignore him either, okay? We just can't focus on him. We must act as Jesus acted. Jesus acknowledged his presence, but his focus was on the Father. His focus was on the Father. He knew who he was. Jesus knew. Jesus was listening to a talk yesterday. Jesus knew that he was... God, 
okay? He knew, because that's his being. He knew he was God. Even though he was in human form, he knew he was God. He didn't discover it somewhere around the age 12, okay? He knew. And so he knew that he was more powerful than Satan. Didn't mean Satan was going to stop tempting him. Didn't mean Satan wasn't going to think about whenever he was out into the desert and Satan's quoting scripture to him. If he's going to do that to Jesus, don't you think he's going to do that to you? We have to understand who our enemy is. The word Satan means adversary, and the word devil means accuser. Adversary and accuser. He is not on your side. He's not on your side. And any time that you feel accused of something, and that's not the same. Like the Holy Spirit will give you conviction. The Holy Spirit, the Spirit of God will convict you, convict you in your sinfulness, you know, make you feel this like, oh my gosh, I don't want to do that anymore. I want to repent. I want to repent. I want to say, I'm sorry. I don't want to live this life anymore. The accuser may tell you the truth about your sin, but the purpose of that is so that you can feel shame and condemnation. My friends, there is no shame and condemnation in Christ Jesus. Now, Satan might tell you the truth only to get you to feel bad because the second part of that is the lie. The second part of that is the, the lie that God's not going to forgive you, that your sins won't be forgiven, that you can't rise new in Christ. That's, he's going he's gonna to dangle a little bit of the truth so that he can distort it because that's who he is. So whenever, whenever you um, are condemned and you feel dirty and you feel shameful, that may be Satan telling you the truth about your life. We just have to learn to recognize this. We have to learn to recognize this pattern. Okay, because he is still an angel, so he does, he is stronger than us in our mere humanity. He is not stronger than the spirit that is within you. Okay, he is not stronger than the spirit is, that is within you. That's why we're not meant to navigate this world alone. Okay, we are meant to be dependent upon, upon, upon God. He schemes. We have to understand his tactics. Scripture does not tell us to put our focus on the enemy, nor does it tell us to fear him. We need not fear anything. Do not fear. Do not fear. Do not fear. We need not fear anything. We need not fear anything. It does not tell us to fear him. Jesus is our model, and his focus is always upon the Father. He said and did only what the Father was saying and doing. That's why we have to have a relationship with him. That's why we have to um, to have this. Uh, it's just about just like a, just like we talk to each other. God, what are you doing here, Father? What are you doing here? I want to do what you're doing. Whenever you're out doing ministry, or whenever you're out, you know, dealing with people, or perhaps even in your own family, there's always a purpose, you know. Um, or I'm sorry, Jesus the. God will always bring around anything for good. So in the midst of even struggles and trials, God, what's the good here? Show me the good. It's having that conversation that's just, it's filial, it's familial. It's, it's like a friend talking to a friend. I want to know what you're doing here because I want to be in agreement with you. I don't want to be in agreement with the enemy. When we're talking to our kids, when our kids are out doing wayward things and things they don't need to be doing or whatever, and we have this, we want to talk to our kids about it like, I need your words, God, because my words are probably going to be anything but how you would be, you know? Um, what are you doing here, God? What do we need to do here? And it's a partnership, okay? We want to do only what the Father is saying and doing. That's that's being like Jesus. And in light of this, we are invited to take our stand against the devil's schemes. We do not have to fall prey to him. We do not have to fall prey to him. We need to understand how he works. He is a liar and the father of lies. He will do anything anything to distort our view of the Father and who we are in the Father's image. Take it all the way back to the garden, y'all. Take it all the way back to the garden. He lied. He lied to them. He didn't tell, he did not tell um, Eve and Adam that God didn't exist. He did not even tell Eve and Adam that God didn't know everything, that he was all knowing and all powerful and everywhere. He didn't even lie to them about that. His deception was in whether or not they could trust him, whether or not they could trust him. He lies. He's been a liar from the beginning. When it sees, when you see that in scripture, it goes all the way back to the garden. 
you know, he was upright until he did that stuff, and then and then he was cast to his belly, right? He was standing upright, but he lied to them about the goodness of God. He lied to them about who God is, not his existence and not his omnipotence and being everywhere for all times, not any of the omnis. He lied to them about God's goodness, about who God is. All the devil's strategies work toward this goal. All the devil's strategies work towards this goal that we would not understand who God is. And it's worked. He's done a real good job. He's done a real good job of throwing it, throwing us off. We get bound up in our woundedness. We, you know, we, we, we might understand it in theory, but we don't own it for ourselves. We don't own it for ourselves. We don't wear the mantle. We do not have the cloak, the rings, and, and the shoes on our feet. You know, we've spent years walking around without the Father's shoes. We just have. And that's what this journey is about. This journey is about getting familiar with how that ring feels on your finger. You know, it's about getting familiar with wearing the shoes that he's put on your feet. It's about becoming familiar with eating at his banquet table. Satan is a counterfeit father who murders his children. He's a counterfeit father who murders his children. He's a liar. He does not want your good. He does not want your good. He does not want your good. And I'm going to I'm going to go on and say it out here. He's murdering babies before they're ever born, okay? He's murdering babies because he's got the influence of the parents, because he's influencing the 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 parents, okay? If you don't think that there's not an attack on your life from the womb, you're 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 underneath the deception of the enemy. Satan is a counterfeit father who murders his children. God the Father is the source of life who gives life. Life begins at the moment of conception. And Satan has done a real good job of taking people out before they ever even breathe their first breath. Okay? At an abundant rate. All right? His... People think he doesn't exist. Satan's empty promises entice us while disguising their true nature. His nature is not for good. His nature is not for good. He, you know, and, and I guess I just want to say that um, if you've fallen under the deception of the enemy and you um, perhaps you've had an abortion, okay, or perhaps you've helped someone else have an abortion, the Father's arms are waiting for you to turn back to him, okay? He just, a repentant, he will, he forgives. He is love. He can't be anything that he's not. Um, there's a spirit of death that is attached to that, okay? There's a spirit of murder that is attached to that. You you need to pray into that. You need to repent, and you need to cast the enemy out of your life, okay? He loves you. Jesus loves you. God the Father loves you, and the Holy Spirit is ready to intercede for you to, um, to break off that influence of the demonic in your life, okay? It is what it is, all right? It is what it is. But you have to understand the schemes of the enemy. When we believe the lies instead of the truth, we fall under his influence. When we believe the lies instead of the truth, we fall under the influence. It starts from the, our first woundedness. Many times it starts before we're ever even born with generational stuff. Okay? So, you know, a lot of times we'll see... Um, and it can be... It can be environmental too, but don't think that Satan doesn't have his hand in, you know, you have, you have um, generations, you have grandparents and parents and children who all have the same type of um, characteristics, excuse me, and anxieties and fears. And that just means st Satan has had a stronghold in the family line, generations, generations, right? Um when we believe the lies instead of the truth, we fall under his influence, setting us on a path towards subjection to his tyranny. The enemy has no power over us unless we give it to him. The enemy has no power over us unless we give it to him. Y'all, hell is a door locked from the inside. Hell is a door locked from the inside. The enemy only has the influence in your life that you've allowed him to have. Now, granted, he may have come in when you were a victim and you didn't you know, you didn't say yes to the things that happened to you, okay? Or maybe it, maybe you have womb wounds 
wounds that happened whenever you were in utero, or maybe it's generational. But I'm telling you, today you have information, and Satan only has the influence in your life that you give him. We're learning about him so that we can take our part in cooperating with Jesus Christ's redemptive work on the cross so that we can be free. The enemy has no power over us unless we give it to him. And there's two basic principles here that the author outlines. And this is where we're going to stop for today. You have the authority over your enemies in the name of Jesus. You have the authority. And when we say enemies... I think it's the different, the different lies, the different um, spirit, the different um, spirits of spirits of anxiety, spirits of fear, uh, orphan spirits. You know, different spirits of lust, spirits of gl- any. They're, they're, it's it's like an army of like you've got an angels and saints, and you've got your heavenly army. The demonic has an army too. All right, really with this. Um, with the authority, it's very it's structured very similarly. It's structured similarly. They're similarly, okay? A third were cast out. Satan has his own army, all right? But we have authority over our enemies. Each one of those is your enemy, all right? We've already talked a little bit about how they work together. Um, we have the authority over our enemies in the name of Jesus. In the name of Jesus, dear children, you dear children are from God and have overcome them. Them, the spirits that are against Christ, because the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. The Holy Spirit is within you. Your body is a temple of the Holy Spirit. Whenever you're baptized, you become a warrior for Christ, and the Spirit of God is within you. And the one who is in you is greater than the one who is in the world. And and there is power in that authority that you've been given. All right, that's the first principle, and we're, we've been working this entire time on understanding who we are in Christ. But you have that authority because that authority has been given to you. It has been given to you. It has been bestowed upon you. Remember, we talked about that. It has been bestowed upon you. The second principle, the second principle, the enemy has power in our lives when he has something in us that agrees with him. When there is something in us that agrees with him. All right? We may not even know it's there. We may not even know it's there. That's the foothold. That's the stronghold. That's the lie that we are in agreement with. That's any thought that is not a thought of life and love in the Father. If there's any, and he is never going to stop trying to regain his ground in your life, okay? He's never going to, what will happen is, you just get to put on the armor of God real quick and you realize, and you you just don't leave home without it, Right? And, and it comes to a place where literally you can pray against this almost in your sleep because the Spirit will pray on your behalf. When we come into agreement with that, think about that, that scripture verse in Romans. When we know not how to pray, the, the Spirit will pray on our behalf. When we when we have surrendered to His will, then, w- then He will fight on our behalf. You, you guys who have consecrated yourself, you know, there's thrones of heaven that will fight on your behalf, okay? When you come into alignment with them, what are you in agreement with? What are you in agreement with? The scripture verse, John 14, 30. John 14, 30. And he gives like three different scripture verses, um, three different um, um, translations, I will not say much more to you, for the prince of this world is coming. He has no hold over me. Those are Jesus' words, okay? Um, Other translations, the NASB and the King James, make it even clearer. He has nothing in me. He has nothing. These are Jesus' words saying, Satan has no foothold, no stronghold, no fortress set up. In Jesus, he has nothing. He tried. He tried to get Jesus to come into agreement with him. Whenever Jesus went out into the desert and Satan came out there and tried to tempt him, and he quoted scripture to him, Jesus knew his identity. He had nothing in him. He had, and if there is something in us that is in agreement with anything that is not life and light and love in Christ, okay? God is love. Jesus is the way. If there's anything in us that is dark at all, then Satan has a little piece of us. Satan has a little piece of us. The enemy has the, and he has power in our lives whenever that's the case. All right. That's why no matter how much therapy you've been through, 
You may have been on this walk with the Lord for a real long time, but if you've not ever truly addressed the wounds, the strongholds, the lies, the vows, the judgments, the unforgiveness, they're still, they're still, he's still got a peace. Okay, you can go through years and years and years of walking with the Lord and nobody's saying you're not walking with the Lord. You are truly walking with the Lord. But if there's still those struggles, if there's still that darkness, that's why you've got to, it's, 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 it's just going deeper. It's going, you may not even realize that this was a thing. Okay, you may not have even realized that this was a thing. But we have a choice in, in going into those deep places. Satan doesn't, maybe perhaps you've been under the veil of the enemy with his deception. Um, and you thought you were just doing everything. You know, maybe you're doing what you need to be doing, but you still have these struggles. That's because there's still something. And we continue to press in and we continue to ask the Lord to reveal to us exactly what it is. And he will reveal to us. And we are being purified in this process, right? He will continue to show you. It's not saying you haven't been walking with the Lord for however many years. It's just that there's more. Remember, he's a God of abundance. He wants us to be completely and totally free. Jesus has given us a choice. Jesus has given us a choice. He has destroyed sin and its power over us. And he invites us to life and freedom as the children of God. He invites us to life and in freedom, a life and freedom as the children of God. That freedom is found in holiness. That is a life that is fully identified with the Father and His will. We just have to continue pursuing it. The only way that you're going to know, you're going to be able to see it by its fruit. You're going to be able to tell by your struggle. Um, we just continue to press in. And you thank God for the revelation whenever you discover that there's still stuff that we need to be working on. You thank him for the revelation. You don't go, my gosh, when is this ever going to be done? When am I ever going to be fixed? When you get to heaven, <laughs> that's it. You will, you will be a sinner until you get there, okay? You will be a sinner, but the struggle purifies you. You are being purged of all yourself. You are going through a purgation, you are going through a purgation, a purification. Malachi 3.3, 3, the refiner's fire. That's what you're going through right now. My friends, it's purgatory here on earth, okay? When you press in and you are allowing yourself to be purified by the Father, that's what it is. You will not be perfect until you see Him. You will not be perfect until you see Him. There's going to be a struggle. There's going to be a struggle. It's up to us to use the authority that He has given us to take our stand, we must participate in our own freedom. We must participate in our own freedom. For Jesus has given us the power to break any chains that remain in our hearts. Jesus has given us the power to break any chains that remain in our hearts. He did the work. Do not get it wrong. He did the work. He took the cross. We have free will. We have free will. We get to cooperate in his redemptive work. We get to cooperate in his redemptive work. We must participate in our own freedom. Otherwise, by our free will, we're choosing to stay in bondage. By our free will, we're choosing to be in agreement with the enemy instead of being in agreement with the Father. He did the work. Don't let the cross be in vain in your life. Don't let it be for naught. All right? Remember, gaze upon him and see which one of those wounds is yours. Which one of those wounds is yours? Which one of those sins is yours? What's still there? Gaze upon him and ask him what's still there that needs to be plucked out. Show me. It's a, it's a beautiful prayer of surrender. Gazing upon his redemptive work, the greatest love story of all time. He gave himself for you so that you could be free. He gave himself for you that, so that you could be free. We participate. We cooperate with his grace. We cooperate with his redemptive work. Don't let it fall upon you and you not be open to it. All right? Don't let it fall upon you and you not be open to it. He, he wants us to be free. We have to understand the tactics of the enemy. Um, the next thing that we're going to do the rest of this is just talking about the devil's lies. Dismantling the devil's lies, the enemy's tactics, lies to idols. And unforgiveness, and he's just given us great examples. Three common lies, okay. Um, I'm gonna take tomorrow and Saturday off because 
um, they're going to be long days here and they start early and I'm on a time, I'm in a different time zone. And so throughout the weekend, um, and you know, tomorrow and stuff, just, just spend some time with the Lord, ask the Holy Spirit to come upon you and to share with you, um, you know, those areas of life spent, read this, read it and read it again and read it again and spend some time sitting in it, you know, and let him show you. Let him show you. I know he will. He's not going to leave you there. You have come to him vulnerable and ready. You've traveled this journey. He's not going to leave you there. Let's let him Let's let him show us. Okay, we will do our Abba's Heart um, Zoom on um, Sunday evening at 7.30. 7.30 to 9.00. Um, I probably won't be on right till 7.30 because we have something going on at church at 6. I'll be driving back on Sunday. Um, I'm, I'm going to post the link in the comments today to this conference that I'm at. They do offer a virtual format. I don't know if any of you guys are... Look, the first talk is on identity, right? It's so great. Um, but it's about um, prophetic ministry and just hearing the voice of the Father Um you guys might be interested. I don't know. So I'm going to put the, um, I'm going to, it's a virtual format. And um, instead of being there, the, they have different rooms that you can break out in. And just, just in case anyone's interested, I'll put the link out. And then um, the Zoom will be the same link that we've had. I'll put it out. I'll put it out too, probably sometime Sunday. Put it out again, but um, if you could just hold me in prayer, and if anyone has any intentions that they want me to, um, I'll be um, praying also and offering my time this weekend as prayer. So um, if you have any intentions, um, just drop them in the comments or send me a private message if you don't want to put it out there publicly. But let's hold each other in prayer. Um, we're everything we do, we do for the glory of God, and I'm just very thankful. Um, I'm just, you know, wanting to be obedient and wanting to um, follow his lead. So um, I appreciate you guys and I love you. And um, I'll see you here Monday morning at 7 a.m. But if you want to get on our Abba's Heart Zoom on um, Sunday evening, that'll be at 730. So some of you guys I'll see then. God bless you and have an amazing whatever day this is. Thursday, Friday, Saturday and Sunday. Goodbye.